Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. We need to anticipate that as many as a third of your workforce at any one time may become ill with COVID-19, and they may not be able to come to work, and we need to adapt businesses so we can operate at these reduced numbers. So what we need to do... Thank you, Minister. Uh, at any given time uh, in, in the coming weeks, we can expect across all sectors a 20 to 30 percent absenteeism as a result uh, of Omicron spreading so rapidly across uh, Ontario. So our health system... That's BC and Ontario's chief medical health officers last week. But those aren't the only places expecting labour shortages as Omicron continues to rampage across the country. Hospitals are experiencing staffing shortages and expecting it to get worse. Airlines, too. Where you might be most likely to see the lack of staff in the next few weeks is in your own neighborhood, at your local store. Business reporter Chris Hannay tells us how businesses and workers are dealing with this latest wave of the pandemic. This is The Decibel. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So we're hearing that up to 30 percent of the workforce could be home sick in the coming weeks. Can you walk us through what are the shortages that we're already seeing right now? Yeah, so we're already seeing um, in a lot of uh, public sector, we're already seeing a lot of uh, harder numbers about what the concerns are. So pretty much every hospital out there has been reporting, uh, you know, up to hundreds of staff that have had to stay home sick. Airlines, for a variety of reasons, including staff shortages, have been having to cancel a lot of flights. Uh, Air Transat on Thursday just said it was canceling 30% of its upcoming flights. Air Canada's had to cancel more than 10%. WestJet's canceled 15% of flights. You know, other municipal services, uh, the Winnipeg police just recently announced a state of emergency because of the number of police officers that were calling in sick. They already had more than 10% of the workforce off and they were worried it's going to get a lot worse. In Toronto, nearly half of libraries were closed. Uh, Metrolinx, which operates Go Transit in the GTA in southern Ontario, they've already reported that they're seeing 20 to 30 percent of staff not show up for shifts. Uh, Again, for a variety of reasons, either the virus or they have to take care of somebody. And Chris, you've been reporting on this and you've been talking to businesses and business owners about this issue. How are people feeling right now? Well, it's interesting. I think a lot of people are nervous about what's going to happen. But, uh, you know, something I've definitely heard in talking to people around industries is that the actual effect of the wave is still, some people are still waiting for it to be felt. So some people have already started noticing staff shortages and other people just assume that it's going to happen. The way that this variant has changed as well, it's, you know, things can change so rapidly with the exponential growth that, you know, from when we started talking to now, it's, it's possible things could be different based on how fast it's moving. Let's talk about grocery stores and and other essential retail stores like that, Chris, because that's how I think a lot of us are really going to see this uh, in our day to day lives pretty quickly. What kind of shortages are we are we seeing there? Yeah, so grocery stores are are interesting because, you know, it's a pretty essential service. People need food. And they were definitely one of the private sector businesses that were already noticing staffing shortages throughout the holidays. The number I was hearing was, you know, close to 20 percent in a lot of stores. Uh, And the grocery stores have really been having to deal with this in different ways. So it might mean limiting the number of hours that they're open because they just don't have as much staff. Uh, Maybe having to close certain parts of the grocery store, like the deli counter, because they don't have somebody to staff it. And, you know, different grocery stores are handling this in different ways. You know, my colleague, uh, Susan Krasinski robertson was was talking to a couple grocery stores earlier this week. You know, Rabba Fine Foods, which operates a number of locations around the GTA, they were saying that they were dealing with it by helping to share staff between locations to try to deal with the gaps in staffing. We also talked to M&M Food Market, uh, who had the opposite approach. They said that they didn't want to share staff between locations because they wanted to maintain bubbles in each store um, because they were concerned that if they shared staff between locations that it could help the virus spread. So, you know, every business is, is trying to deal with this in a different way. Let's also talk about restaurants, Chris, because we've heard a lot about restaurants already dealing with labor shortages, uh, even before Omicron was a factor. What are you hearing from this sector? You know, it's one of the things playing in here is that it's not just the effect of the virus, but it's also the effect of the public health orders 
that are, you know, are, are needed to help contain the spread of the virus. It's, the timing is really tough on these businesses. Um, you know, the, the Omicron first became, I think, a real concern for people in December. And December is a great month for a lot of restaurants because, you know, people are booking holiday parties, they're doing get togethers, they want to see each other for Christmas. And a lot of restaurant business owners and a lot of um, staff at these restaurants are really counting on the extra business, you know, for workers, they might be counting on the extra shifts, um, the higher tips. And so they make a lot of their annual revenue in that period. And people starting mid-December, people started canceling holiday parties, started canceling all um, events. And uh, so it was really bad timing. Uh, it's the same for gyms as well, actually. Um, a lot of fitness facilities have also been closed um, around the country. Uh, in BC, actually, it's uh, there's very few businesses that are restricted, but fitness facilities are one of them. And uh, January is a boom time. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. You know, people make their New Year's resolutions and they sign up for the gym membership, uh, whether or not they end up going in. And so having these restrictions come into effect right before New Year's is just devastating to a lot of the fitness facilities um, that were really counting on this extra business. Most provinces have recently reduced isolation time for those who are vaccinated. So if you do get sick, that period went down from 10 days of isolation to five days, as long as people don't have symptoms. Will cutting that isolation time in half there, from what you're hearing, will that have a significant impact on businesses who are facing a workplace shortage? Yeah, it might. I mean, this is a it's an interesting point because this is sort of this is a question that really runs the gamut of uh, opinions here. Right. Because, you know, when we talk about the small business community, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of businesses and every range of person, uh, manager, owner that you could imagine. So I think depending on the industry and the person, you know, there are certainly some businesses that are saying, this is great. Shorter isolation time, we can get people back to work. It's going to be easier for me to, to deal with staff shortages. People won't be off as long. But there are certainly some uh, business owners out there who say, the last thing I want is to have an outbreak at work. So if there's any concern that you're sick, just stay home. Don't come in. And they may be more cautious about really wanting to prevent an outbreak. And in those cases, they may not, you may take the, you know, the at least five days as a, as a guideline and may want their people to stay home for longer. Let's talk about worker compensation, though, too. So if we're asking people to isolate for at least five days, that means we're asking them to, to take those five days off work. What is the current situation with paid sick leave in this country and the compensation that people can get? Yeah, so there's kind of two things here. So there's paid sick days for people who are still employed. So this is an issue where it really varies across the country. You know, the, the federal liberal government recently announced it was going to make it have a minimum of 10 uh, sick days for federally regulated businesses which is about 6% of businesses are federally regulated. So we're talking about, you know, transport, airlines, that kind of thing. And then when you go to provinces, there's a lot of different uh, rules about the number of sick days. You know, in Ontario, the Ontario government has had a, um, a more generous paid sick leave, um, but it's temporary. It's supposed to expire at the end of June. But then there's also the issue of people who have lost work because of the pandemic. So in a lot of cases, uh, you know, in, in the restaurant industry in particular, indoor dining has been banned in most provinces. And uh, restaurant owners, because they're not having revenue, come in, have once again laid off staff. Uh, and this has really been one of the major labor issues in, in the restaurant industry throughout the pandemic is the fact that if you work there, you this is like the fifth time you may have been laid off in the last two years. And that's hard financially, that's hard psychologically. And every time one of these waves come up, uh, more and more people are leaving the industry. Mm -hmm. So for people who have lost their jobs recently because of the new restrictions coming into place, there is a federal benefit. You know, there's the CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Early in the pandemic, certainly got a lot of attention. That was a $500 a week benefit. The current one that's there is a less generous and more limited version of the program. Um, called the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit. That's uh, At the moment, that's $300 a week. Um, so that helps out some people who may have been laid off or lost shifts because of the pandemic. But there's certainly a lot of um, worker advocates who are pointing out that $300 a week 
uh, depending on where you live in Canada, isn't a lot. If you live in Toronto, $300 a week minus whatever you pay in tax probably doesn't cover your rent. So depending on how long the lockdown lasts, um, that benefit might not get you very far. Why have those programs changed? What's the, I guess, the thinking behind that shift there? Um, the government supports have been very necessary for a lot of workers and a lot of business owners. It has come at a pretty huge cost to the government. Um, just, you know, tens of billions of dollars have gone into these programs, the wage subsidy, CERB, the rent subsidy. And so, you know, the federal liberal government was really starting to feel that pressure last year to wind these programs down, make them less generous, make them more limited because they thought, uh, you know, we've already spent a lot of money and we have to show that we're fiscally prudent. And um, the worst, again, with, it feels like the worst of the pandemic is probably over. So uh, we're probably safe to do that. So most of the programs that we knew, the wage and rent subsidies uh, ended in October, as did the uh, CRB, which was the successor to the CERB. Um, I'm trying not to use too many acronyms, but there's a whole lot of acronyms that uh, come out for <laughs> government hard. programs. Uh, it's hard to keep track. But most of the programs, as we knew them, ended at the end of October and were, were replaced by more limited and less generous programs. So just, I guess, to really clarify here then, Chris, so if people are having to isolate for five days, um, but they don't get five days of paid sick leave, then we're asking people to take that time off without pay. Is that correct? That's right. Are you hearing from people that you're talking to that they're concerned they won't have enough paid sick days or the support that they need if they do get ill and, and need to, you know, refrain from coming into work there? Yeah, it's certainly a big concern for a lot of people um, in a lot of industries where they don't get paid sick leave. I mean, I think it's it's easy sometimes to forget if you're, you know, a well-paid professional who maybe take your sick days for granted, um, that there's a whole lot of industries. I think over half of, you know, people who are employed in Canada don't have paid sick leave as part of their workplace policies. So, you know, if you're working in a job where you're, uh, it's low wage and you, you really require every shift to survive, you're living paycheck to paycheck. If you don't have that paid sick time, you might be trying to hide your symptoms. You might be coming into work when you're still contagious. And so, you know, there are lots of people arguing that this is, you know, a moral imperative to give people paid sick leave, but there's also lots of economic arguments that uh, and public health arguments that you really don't want people coming to work when they're sick, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. So certainly in Ontario, uh, the Ontario NDP has been calling for a minimum of 10 sick days, paid sick days, uh, as well as an extra two weeks, an extra 14 days in the middle of a pandemic, um, such as the one that we're in right now. We've talked a lot about how businesses on a high level are approaching things. But I guess what about the, you know, the frontline workers themselves who have to show up in a pandemic and are interacting with a, a lot of people on a daily basis? How do you think about interacting with these individuals or how do you, I guess, approach these situations? Yeah, I think the most important thing to remember is just, you know, be kind. A lot of frontline workers are having to deal with a lot of stress. I've certainly heard from people over the course of the pandemic about the fact that customers on the whole are a lot less pleasant to deal with during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, everybody's stressed. Uh, you're stressed. I'm stressed. Um, I'm sure our listeners are stressed. And uh, people on a lot of frontline work are also having to bear the brunt of everybody else's stress. And in a lot of cases, they're having to enforce public health orders that are, you know, ne necessary in most cases to, to contain the spread of the virus. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, they don't have any control about it. You know, they didn't decide the rules. They're forced by law to comply with them. And so there's, you know, if you don't like that rule, there's no sense in taking it out on the frontline worker who's just trying to fulfill their job. You know, I talk to a lot of businesses and, and I think the message I just hear over and over again from people is just, you know, please be kind to the frontline workers. Please be kind to the people who are having to deal with this and who you're relying on for, you know, everything from your health care to running the buses that you use to get to work. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.